All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Hopefully, everybody's able to be logged on and see. Um, we're going to be discussing today uh, improving community safety, uh, mental health response through policing partnerships. Um, we are joined today by a number of panelists that I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but first, we'd like to start with an icebreaker. And in the chat, if you could tell us why you all joined today's discussion, and can you let us know where you're Zooming in from? And as folks are populating that into the chat, I will start with some introductions for our panelists. So my name is Brian Agard, and I'm a researcher at RTI International. And I work with our justice practice area and the Transformative Research Unit for Equity, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion. Also from RTI joining me is Dr. Kristen Stainbrook. Kristen is a senior justice and behavioral health researcher in RTI's justice practice area and has over 25 years of experience in the design and implementation of process and outcome studies of behavioral health interventions in the areas of jail diversion, community-based crisis response, reentry, and for persons experience homelessness. Thanks for joining, Kristen. Also with us, uh, first, our, one of our first panelists from the city of Greensboro is Letitia McNeil. Letitia manages Greensboro's Office of Community Safe Safety, which was established just over one year ago. Letitia joined the city in 2019 and previously served as the Criminal Justice Administrator with the Greensboro Criminal Justice Advisory Commission. Thanks for joining, Letitia. Next up, we have Chief John Thompson. Chief Thompson has been the Chief of the Greensboro Police Department since 2022 and has worked in a variety of capacity for GPD over 20 years including the Bureau Commander of the Patrol Division, the Commanding Officer for Resource Management, and leading the Research and Planning Unit. Thanks for joining, Chief. Erin Williams is the last participant that we have from Greensboro, and she is the lead mental health clinician for Greensboro's Behavioral Health Response Team. The city's uh, Behavioral Health Response Team consists of Greensboro Police Department officers and OCS's team of licensed clinicians and crisis counselors. Great to see you. Thanks for joining, Erin. We also have two panelists from just up the road in the city of Durham. First, we have Director Ryan Smith. Ryan leads the Durham's Community Safety Department. Prior to that, Ryan has led uh, well. Ryan has led the department since its inception in 2021, and previously led Durham's Innovation Team. Thank you for joining, Ryan. Last and certainly not least, we have Kirby Jones. Kirby Jones recently promoted. Congratulations to supervise a team of unarmed crisis response clinicians within the Durham Community Safety Department. Kirby previously served as a crisis counselor for the Chapel Hill Police Department and joins us today. That rounds out our panelists. Thanks for joining us. And to kick off our discussion today and ground what we're talking about, can we get a little bit of background on uh, the uh, organizations within your city? And we'll, we'll start with the folks from Greensboro. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background on how the Office of Community Safety came to be in Greensboro? Sure, uh, Brian. So back in uh, 2000 and 22, uh, the office was founded. So we're coming up on a year, not quite the end of this month will be a year. Uh, and what we um, were tasked to, to do is we want to work with uh, our public safety entities to enhance public safety by bringing in community voice, uh, supporting our alternative responses uh, to calls for service, and uh, creating a hub where community, uh, public safety, and our uh, city government can all meet collectively to find uh, solutions to address societal issues. And we, we came about this probably back in 2020, we started looking at uh, trying to identify ways that we could enhance uh, public safety and bring in uh, alternative responses for calls for service that did not always involve um, a sworn officer. And so we started with some uh, mental health components and uh, behavioral health response team kind of uh, came from that those discussions, but then we wanted to be able to look at how we can do that across the board with other other avenues, not just looking at uh, mental health. So we wanted to look at violence prevention uh, as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Letitia. And Chief Thompson, do you want to describe a little bit about the political climate and the impetus for the city wanting to examine this change? 
Yeah, it, it actually started uh, earlier than that. I think, unfortunately, like many cities, we experienced a uh, an in-custody death here in Greensboro, 2018-2019, with an individual who was in a, a behavioral health crisis. And that really started the elected officials talking about what uh, alternative responses were out there for uh, mental health or individuals experiencing mental health crisis. And that started that conversation specifically around that that alternative response. And that, and uh, I think Letitia and I were involved uh, back then in what uh, a response would look like. And, and I kind of joked that her and I have been kind of um, scheming behind the scenes for the last three or four years because we kind of saw the need for not just mental health response, but alternative responses to substance abuse, to, to mental health, um, and, and, and violence interventions. And so we kind of saw this coming and we've just been working at it for the last three or four years to develop this office to encompass uh, a number of alternative responses uh, to what police historically have had to respond to. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chief. Director Smith in Durham, um, similar story. Can you tell us about the uh, genesis of the Community Safety Department in Durham? Sure. I think there are a lot of similarities. I think in a Durham story, I always say it starts back with um, folks across our community who have been organizing around issues related to this for for years. Um, there was the murder of George Floyd and, and you know, what that sparked in cities across the country. And one of the things that came as a result of that in Durham was our city manager connecting to RTI and really wanting to learn more about our 911 calls. And so our city, along with Greensboro and others, ended up forming a cohort with RTI and looked at three years of call data to understand why people call 911, what are the outcomes of those calls, it was a use of force analysis for how many calls and of what kind were associated with use of force, focus groups with law enforcement, RTI did a kind of high level survey of uh, the landscape of what how other cities were beginning to think about responding to some of these calls. All of this was presented like early, maybe January, the year of 2021 uh, to our city council. And then we had a new city manager, our now city manager, Wanda Page, who received all of that, um, all of that data and research from RTI. And it was ultimately her decision uh, as her first and her first budget to create a new department that would spearhead you know, leading the development of new kinds of responses to be a part of our broader public safety team, um, but developing alternative responses. So the Community Safety Department was created the summer of uh, 2021, um, charged with initially developing pilots. So let's think about the kind of things we want to do. Let's do them in a small way and evaluate their promise and then think about what we might scale. Uh, we spent our first year doing a lot of careful planning. So we worked with uh, other agency partners, police, um, EMS, behavioral health providers to figure out what it is we wanted to do. We engaged a lot with the community. We continued to look at data and learn from other cities who were a little further ahead. And then ultimately a little over a year ago, so in June of 2022, we started what is now HART in Durham, which means Holistic Empathetic Assistance Response Team. And HART is four things. We have clinicians in our 911 call center who are there to immediately be able to connect with a caller who may be experiencing a crisis or someone is calling about maybe someone they're with or a loved one who is experiencing a crisis and uh, needs that immediate support from a, a licensed mental health professional. We have community response teams, which Kirby has served on. Um, Kirby's done pra practically all of this work in his first year. Community response teams respond to calls that we used to send law enforcement to, but they're now non-law enforcement calls. These include trespass, suicide threat without a weapon, mental health crisis without reported physical violence, a range of other things. Uh, we have a three-person model with a clinician, peer, and EMT. We have co-response that kind of similar to Greensboro is a joint response between our department and then the police department where we have clinicians who are paired with CIT trained officers that go to events where there may be higher indicators of risk. Maybe it's a suicide threat with a weapon, mental health crisis where there's physical violence. And then we also have our fourth program, which is care navigation, which is about what happens in the days and weeks following a crisis. Mm -hmm. So we uh, connect people with uh, peer support and licensed clinicians who continue to work with someone over the span of the next month to help I connect them to other um, other services or resources in our community that help address the needs that they've identified. 
those are the four things that we're doing. Uh, and this year, we're going to be scaling uh, citywide seven days a week, at least 12 hours a day across all those programs. Well, that's a ton of growth in a short amount of time. Thank you so much, Ryan. And Ryan mentioned uh, RTI International. That's the organization that Kristen and I work for. We're a uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute uh, located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And so we've had the pleasure of working not only with Durham and Greensboro on some of this work, but a number of other entities across North and South Carolina. And we're really trying to understand this, what's happening nationally. So really appreciate that context there. And so this is for either the folks in Greensboro or Durham or both. Uh, what have been some of the early challenges that you've all had to work to overcome? I, I see would say uh, some, some of the early challenges that, that we had to, to work to overcome were, one, uh, how we wanted to actually implement this, this uh, level of care. We uh, initially started out with a, a contracted provider who would respond to uh, scenes after police had had uh, a level of engagement with uh, a person needing services. And so we found very quickly that there were some issues uh, with that type of response. Uh, we, we saw that, you know, there was frustration on, um, you know, from a community standpoint, there was frustration from uh, our officer standpoint, and then there was no follow up uh, with service coordination. And for us, that was a big part of what we were trying to do is figure out a way to connect folks with uh, the resources and services that they needed in the community. And we wanted to be able to measure uh, and track the that that was being done. And so that was uh, one of our biggest uh, challenges. But from that, we, I mean, it, it created a great opportunity for us to uh, dig deeper. And uh, like Chief Thompson said earlier, you know, we've been behind the scenes working on this. And then we were able to sort of research what was going on across the country and how other agencies were responding to similar calls for service. And it allowed us to really develop a model that was able to uh, be effective here in Greensboro by having our uh, clinicians co-respond with our law enforcement officers and then having um, our clinicians to also be able to do that follow-up um, with the persons in crisis afterwards to connect them with services and have uh, the outreach coordinator whose uh, responsibility it is to help you know further connect those folks with uh, other quality of life services, whether, you know, it may be something related to mental health, but then also uh, substance use disorder and also um, homelessness or, or uh, employment opportunities and things of that nature. Thanks, Letitia. That's really helpful. Well, I just want a second for those who are, I think one of the big decision points for cities is develop this capacity in-house or to outsource it. And like Greensboro, and in part because we learned from Greensboro's experience, we made the decision to treat this like we would any other crucial public safety service, which is we need to develop this capacity in-house. I think that's crucial for, um, it's crucial for culture building, it's crucial for accountability. I think if we really want um, our, we call them alternative responders, but we'll, you know, hopefully we stop in time. If we really want them to be viewed by other first responders as kind of a part of that broader public safety team, then I think it's crucial that they be city employees. Otherwise, I think it seems like they're apart from and other than. Um, so I, I just want to name, I, I think I think broadly, it's not as challenging as maybe some who may but might be considering this. It's not as challenging as it might seem. And that's in part because there are enough cities that have done it that are happy to share like the criteria that they've used to like identify yeah. calls and to help address some of the concerns that are natural in any city considering this is like, what well, is this safe to do? And there's a ton of evidence and growing evidence that yes, you can send responders to calls that you used to send police to, and you can do that in a way that's consistent and appropriate with safety and addressing the needs. There's a lot out there that can help cities jumpstart this. Um, I think one of the things that is always challenging probably in any city is navigating the politics of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and when the narrative is not in your control, so, it, you know, how council members or how the public may talk about this work may be different than how it is positioned within the city. Um, 
in Durham, we've worked really hard to develop a strong collaboration, for example, with the police department. And sometimes there are things beyond your control about how how members of, you know, how, how residents or members of the public may talk about or position the work. And so I think we're fortunate here to have strong leadership in the police department that's been very supportive and are working to continue to position this work in a way that we're a part of a team, that we each have a role to play and, and a relationship that isn't antagonistic. And I think the city should really believe that's possible. You can do that, but you also have to be really committed to doing it because there are lots of small things that could derail it and having leadership that is supportive of it um, and then thinking about things you can do to reinforce it. One of the things that I think we have done to address that in small ways is our team started sending kudos emails. So as they're out on calls um, and see officers really demonstrating compassionate care for neighbors, we share that with the police chief and, and their chain of command. And I think that helps like these new responders who are, yes, are doing some things, um, some things that we used to send law enforcement to, and they're doing some things in partnership with law enforcement. They also see and can appreciate the good work that is already being done. And I think that helps build a stronger connection between these, which are really crucial for success of this work long-term. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate that. And, and Ryan, uh, you alluded to Greensboro and their thought leadership as being one of the jurisdictions that um, helped you create the uh, Durham Community Safety Department. Um, both in Greensboro and Durham, I think there's been a ton of thought leadership in this space. But were there other jurisdictions you all look to and learn from uh, for this work? Yeah, I mean, just to name a few, we learned from, so San Francisco, San Francisco really informed our three-person model for our community response team and our commitment to dedicated follow-up. We learned from Denver Star, um, which people pro probably heard about. We learned from Albuquerque, which is another community safety department in New Mexico that's doing a lot of interesting work. We learned from Austin and Houston about crisis called aversion, you know, some from Portland. There are cities, there's just more and more cities every year that are doing this work. And I do think that it's exciting and it, it it's really encouraging the community of support that is forming around that and how how sharing everyone is like Aaron, you know, when Aaron was getting started, Aaron and I had a conversation. She was very generous with her time and we have been so with other cities. And I think that really helps set all this work up for success across the country. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that was one of the biggest benefits of the cohort of cities, that project is having that project be a, a, a learned experience across many different jurisdictions was just so helpful. And a little bit ago, um, Ryan and Letitia mentioned some of the misconceptions of the work and what it looks like actually out working in the community. So Aaron, Kirby, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the common misconceptions you hear about the work? And what does it actually look like when you're interacting with these community members and neighbors? Yeah, I mean, I think there can be misconceptions on on both sides. So when we're out um, from maybe a law enforcement perspective, I think sometimes there's a misconception that we're not adding anything to the scene, right? That um, we're going to have the same options available that maybe officers would, and we're just taking people to the hospital or, you know, maybe not doing as much follow up, but not really understanding all the the background of the work that we do and, and the resources that we're tied in with. And then I think certainly from the, the community, um, I would say that that misconception is probably shared. People just don't know that like, yes, although we're a crisis team, um, we're really invested in, in making that linkage um, and, and following through, you know, we get emails a lot of times from um, citizens, from other providers who are worried about people in the community who maybe, um, again, don't know the full scope of the, the work that we're doing that we just can't always share. Um, but we stay connected to individuals long term. There probably are some people that we have known since our team started in 2021 um, that we're working diligently to do. And I think um, just really getting a grasp for that sometimes can be hard to, to think about with just the, um, the initial thought around co-response. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I think uh, one of the misconceptions that cause some friction in, in some of the work that we see here in Durham is that I, I are, are some of our neighbors and, and community organizations and other agencies that we are building relationships with sort of have this underlying perception or misconception that 
we as a new department have new resources that that don't currently already exist um and and that or or in the, in a similar way that we are here to replace some of those existing resources and i think it's born out of a few different things i know really early on you know when i i joined the team last august and uh, we we really talked of our aspirations and hopes of how how can we really help fill in the gaps um and and bring and bring attention to some of the gaps of services and resources in our area and and how can we be the 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 ones to help bridge that gap right and and i think really early on we we set out and when we started to engage and to interact interact and, and understand and hear the stories of our neighbors that 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 their issues are so complicated and and so multi-layered that uh, it's it's a bigger issue and bigger challenges than just mental health or just substance use or just homelessness, and and I think what we're understanding in, or what we've gained a deeper understanding in, in our engagement with our neighbors is that a lot of them are connected in some way to some level of support or resources, and and I think early on some of our successes in that may have produced a risk, uh, an outcome that may not have been typical. Like for example, we, we've, there've been several occasions where we've been able to find a, a funding for a hotel, for a family, for a mother who has two children and, and, and nowhere else to stay. And in those moments of, of celebration and in those moments of, of a lot of collaboration and work, that's not a sustainable long-term thing that we can provide in every situation. And I think our neighbors have 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 had. We can tell sometimes they have the expectations that we can provide some of those things when when we really can't. Some of our other government agencies and and our other uh, organizations in the community that work with some of our neighbors that we frequently interact with uh, will refer them to us to 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 achieve some of these outcomes that we've had in the past. And when that's not really something that we can, that we can provide long-term or as a provider. And so I think it's challenging when, when you try to think about how do you fill in gaps as a clinician, as a peer support, and also as a first responder in, in the realm of public safety is a really interesting dynamic. And so I think some of that comes with, and some of those things are not necessarily not all of those misconceptions are systemic or structurally. And, you know, sometimes, and I think a classic example of this, when we respond to a trespass call, you know, our our some needs and some desired outcomes contradict or get in the way of the needs of some of our other neighbors, and and there there some neighbors perception of what a, a desired outcome might look like is not something that we can provide. So for example, if a business owner calls because there's someone on their property and they want them removed and, you know, from if, if, if that individual is ends up, you know, relocating or leaving the premises is sometimes the business owners will ask us, well, you know, what, what did you do? What, what's the outcome or what services did you provide? And, and the question is really trying to answer what is going to keep them from coming back. And that's not really, that's not a, uh, that's not something that we can necessarily guarantee because as, as, we are working with our neighbors. There's still a lack of mental health accessibility. There's still a lack of, of housing. And, and that's not something that we can kind of just magically sort of put in place in those moments. And so uh, it's interesting trying to deal with those expectations and, and, and as we've grown over the last year or so. Yeah, Kirby, thank you so much for that really thoughtful reply. And we're keeping an eye on the question and answers. We're going to try to address as many of the questions from the audience as we can. And one that came in as you were talking, Kirby, and I think this is open to anyone, but especially for Kirby and Aaron who've been out in the field, what has been the community response and has that been positive or negative to having a alternative responder and not a uniformed officer uh, respond to a crisis situation? Has there been resistance to making that change? Peter, thank you so much for that question. 
Yeah. I'll say that um, for yeah. us, I mean, we're obviously still mostly partnered with officers um, for the, the call for service. Um, so it's maybe slightly less of an adjustment because the the typical responder is still present. Um, but sometimes people don't know what to to make of us. Sometimes people think that we're officer in training or we're doing a ride along or <laughs> something along those lines. Um, but as we're getting out there more and more and once people realize who we are, um, I would say it's been overwhelmingly positive. There are certainly some cases where we show up and people are offended that a mental health professional is on scene because they view their situation as having a legal basis and they're not sure why we were dispatched. Um, so that definitely does come up. We've gotten much better, I think, over the, the time that we've been in existence of um navigating that, of being really general about the support that we can provide, of how we can help, you know, people in general dealing with crisis or stress. Um, I think we also have worked really well with our officer partners. Uh, there are just some situations where the officer is going to take the lead and we listen and we maybe help after the fact with resources, but we take a back seat in that moment. And so just learning a little bit of the flow of that. But um, by and large, I think it's been been positive to us being on scene. Okay. Thanks. And I, I would echo most most of what Aaron had said. I think in our interactions um, in the field, a lot of our families and a lot of our uh, neighbors are really grateful. Um, and there's so many times in so many ways that they're just so thankful that an officer wasn't sent to this call or that uh, that um, that there is an, another opportunity to engage with someone when we think about ex being when we think about like accessibility to help um 911 is the the is one of the most immediate forms of help that you can get and when there's there's another option our neighbors have been really grateful that that it might not necessarily be a legal thing it might not necessarily be a medical concern there might not be a fire right but i i being that we can build some connection and relationship with people. Sometimes that's a lot of what people need, sometimes more than, than a, a, a plan of, of what's next for them. It's just just a presence and just a, providing a space for them. And so I find that we've really had a lot of good feedback from our community. And I know in the beginning stages, some of our officers that were a little bit hesitant with some of our presence. And, and I think we've seen a real shift in our officers' uh, relationships. And, and not to say that, because we've had some soft officers that have been on board with us uh, from the beginning and others have been a little bit slower to warm. Um, but those officers that have been slower to warm, we've, we've really started to see, I think they've had an opportunity to see that we're not here to replace their roles were not here to to say that that they're not doing a good enough job, um, and I and I think that being able to work with them in that way, they've they've been able to be a little bit more eased by our presence, and so that's been really cool to see too. Now, I really appreciate you raising that point, Kirby, and that's interesting perspective from Durham on how the police department has worked in partnership there. Chief Thompson, can you talk a little bit about how um, these responders, the alternative responders and Aaron's team have been received by the, the staff and GPD? Yeah, so as Letitia had mentioned, we, uh, when we started our initial um, alternative response model, we had contracted with an outside company and utilized that company to respond to the scene. They had crisis counselors. When we had a, a call that fit the category, they would be contacted. Uh, and then be able to re respond to the scene after an officer had arrived on scene, made sure it was safe. Um, and it really just was was not a good model for us here in, in Greensboro. And so when we transitioned to making them city employees, um, it, it really did not take long at all for that relationship to develop. Partially, they're out riding with the officers. And so the officer seeing that good work with the crisis counselors that kind of spread pretty quickly throughout the organization. But for our organization, when you were to go out and talk to officers and make lineups, they know they are not the best trained, qualified individual to handle somebody with 
uh, a mental health crisis. They they know their tool belt's limited. They've got an option of hopefully they can take them to the hospital if they're compliant or if there's a crime committed, they, they could end up in jail. And so um, once officers, it, it kind of click with them that, hold on a second, there's somebody else that can go out, address a mental health crisis who's probably going to be more trained, more qualified, understand what's happening a little bit better. Uh, I would say, you know, you you would think that when you listen to our call radios, the amount of times that our B Heart units are called, it's nonstop when they're on the clock. I mean, they take a couple thousand calls a year for a, a relatively small unit of, I think, seven officers and and paired crisis counselors. Um, but the officers uh, absolutely love the unit and the work that they're doing and the relationship that unit with the crisis counselors has built in the department. Um, if I wanted to lose my job very quickly, I would disband that unit because my de my entire department would be in my office with a mutiny saying, you are just insane. And so uh, it's it's really developed well in our agency. Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't want you to go anywhere, Chief Thompson. And a related question from attendee, Aaron, this one might be um, relevant to you. Lynn asks, how are you funded, Aaron? And maybe, Aaron, you can make a plug for uh, further funding if that's appropriate in this venue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are definitely lucky that we are funded through the city. Um, I know a lot of teams are funded through grants, and that's a, a great option to get extra sources of revenue. But nice that we um, are are funded directly through the city. And yes, we would love to to get some extra funding. I think our Biggest challenges, as Letitia mentioned, when we were getting up and running was a lot about like, what is this going to look like? What model is going to work for us? But now that we're established, I think our biggest challenge is we don't have enough people to do the work. Um, yeah. We need more counselors to be able to answer the calls, to be able to do the follow up, to be able to be present if somebody's sick. You know, we're we're very short staffed and we only cover Monday through Friday, um, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. So we're obviously missing a chunk of the call. So now that we know what we have is is really solid, I think the next step is um, hopefully, um, you know, being able to expand our reach. All right. Thanks so much. And I think so many of these conversations, especially as we participated in the cohort of cities, were really wanted um, to be grounded in wherever possible, an evidence base, or at least at a minimum, be data-driven. And so, Kristen, I have a, a few questions for you. And, and first, can you please describe the evidence base for some of these programs? You hear a lot about programs like Cahoots. It's received a lot of attention. Uh, what do we know about what works and why? Because I think that's critical to inform the conversation about how these things should be expanded and, um, and what works. That's a great question, uh, Brian. And Really, even though uh, a lot of these programs have been around for a long time, there isn't a lot of research that actually uh, studies program impacts and outcomes. Much of the data, as Ryan uh, mentioned, focuses on enumerating the services. How many calls were addressed, what types of calls, the um, what types of services were delivered on the calls, how long they lasted. Uh, and this is all very important information for understanding the programs. Uh, there's also been some process evaluations that have looked at um, how programs have implemented and even uh, stakeholder and community satisfaction. And then a lot of these programs have relied on anecdotal information, which is plentiful. Clearly, a lot of these programs, as you just heard, are well received by the community and people value their um, participation on these calls for service. But uh, what's really at heart here is um, there is a lack of evidence for if uh, these calls for service, these responses by clinicians, co-response, peer support, however the model may be organized, do they in fact uh, provide better outcomes to calls than traditional law enforcement? And though intuitively we, we believe that to be the case, there actually hasn't been any research that's really examined this piece of it, even for ones that have been around for a long time, like CAHOOTS. So we're just starting. There's just some recent research that has been um, looking at this, including a study that we are going to be doing with um, Durham and Greensboro. Uh, 
And one of our colleagues, RTI, also has an RCT where he's a research control trial that he's looking at, a co-response in Indianapolis. Um, but for the most part, the research just isn't there that it is definitively a better uh, outcome to send a co-response or an alternative response than traditional law enforcement, even though in our hearts, we believe that to be the case. So um, part of our work will be doing a study that actually will add to this evidence and, and really build the base for all of the good work that's going on. Um, that's not to say, of course, that uh, have, knowing about the numbers of services delivered, they have shown, demonstrated that they can be implemented. It's just really that impact piece that we, it's sort of a black box. Yeah, Kristen, and, and I've got a couple of questions. And the first I'd like to hear from everybody, but I'd like to hear from you first, but can you talk a little bit about why evaluating these programs is so important? And also what is it about Greensboro and Durham that make them so well suited for evaluation? Sure. Um, so, you know, as I just indicated, it's very important to understand what are the actual outcomes and are the, do these uh, alternative response in whatever form they may be actually result in a better uh, impact for the client, for the community. And in the absence of knowing this definitively, we can't say there are any unintentional harms or impacts that might be occurring from these programs. Uh, so that is an important component of being uh, evaluated. In addition, it helps justify the expansion of these programs to other communities, especially for ones that might be not convinced that they can um, actually have an impact or they're worth implementing. And then for communities that have them, and I'm sure others will speak to this, um, it can help justify continued uh, investment in the programs in the communities and support uh, the program improvement activities. Um, in particular, I'll say a little bit about why uh, Greensboro and Durham have been um, are have been great to work with and you know really excited about this study with them. Um, the key for our study is having a data collection process and systems that can uh, document the 911 call triage and dispatch. Um, that's really at the center of how all these alternative responses work. And my colleagues and I, when we first started trying to design the evaluation, met with folks in Durham and Greensboro, as well as a few other jurisdictions that were interested in evaluation to really understand uh, what, how do the programs function? What data is available? What isn't? How do the systems work? And then is there enough data to have um, statistical power to be say, able to say something meaningful? And that was the, really the starting base. And the key was to really understand if, um, uh, if the 911 calls, uh, if they could identify eligible calls consistently and minimize call taker discretion, thereby uh, minimizing potential bias in selecting who gets a call and who doesn't, and then having a system that's able to document this process. So we know about all the calls that are would be eligible for an alternative response, even if they don't get one because they're not um, you know, in service at that time, they're on another call, or you just don't have the capacity. And you, you just heard Aaron talk about some of those issues. So Durham and Greensboro had these things in place, and I think that was in a large part because of the data different processes that they just described in setting up their programs, really thinking through their calls, set themselves up very nicely for this kind of analysis. Um, and uh, they have been great partners and we're very excited about uh, getting this research started so we can begin to build this evidence base. Yeah, thanks so much, Kristen. And, and Madison asked a question that I think has been really relevant. You touched on a little bit there but how are we defining better outcomes for these calls and what kind of outcomes should future research be focused on? I think early on, we talked a little bit about use of force and um, while oftentimes um, tragic, sometimes necessary, um, it's an extremely rare outcome. Um, so what are some of the other outcomes that folks may be interested in? One off the top of my head is connection to services, maybe uh, continued use of services. Are there others, uh, Kristen, that we should think about for research and then folks in Greensboro and Durham, um, what are the things that you want? What are the goals and, and objectives and outcomes that you're, are critical to you? Well, I can speak to what we're looking at in our study. So we're using a quasi-experimental design. We'll, we'll compare the incident level outcomes from the call for service that receives either be heart or heart to the calls that do not receive this response. So we're looking at, as you mentioned, use of force, arrests, 
citations, um, reports for uh, on officers, uh, and involuntary transportation to hospitals or um, other facilities. And then we're also looking at some positive outcomes in terms of voluntary transport, because we know sometimes law enforcement actually do do that. And to the extent possible, we're trying to track service referrals. But the key for our particular study is being able to document them in both places. Um, I will also say we do have uh, a process piece of it. So we're not just looking at the outcomes of these calls, but really understanding the context, the services in which these uh, interventions are being implemented, which I believe is essential to really understanding the outcomes, because how will you know what's good or bad <laughs> unless you know, and if, if it can be attributed to the program, unless you're documenting that. And then we also have a cost piece to our study. So we'll be looking at the net benefit from each of those types of responses. Um, but there are other approaches, I think, that can be implemented in different communities, depending on the data available. Certainly, if um, we were able to track long-term outcomes, that might be something we might follow. Or if there was more extensive data collected at the police level about what happens there, we could collect that. So it really sort of depends on the on the data that's available. But we do have those range of sort of incident level outcomes um, for the, uh, as I just mentioned, the arrest, et cetera. Um, but uh, we have tried to take into account all of what uh, Durham and Greensboro are interested to in our assessment. Um, so I'd love to hear more about what they're interested in, some of the things that they, they thought about. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Folks in Durham, uh, Greensboro, outcomes that you're interested in and, and why participate um, in, in this and why is uh, evaluation important to you all? Well, I would say, you know, for, for Greensboro, I think one of the things that's important for us as we are creating these types of alternative responses is that it's data driven. You know, we we went into this looking at uh, how can how can we use the data that we uh, collect to make the best decisions on the effectiveness of these programs and being able to one uh, justify their existence yeah. and then two uh, use it as a basis for increased funding so that we can uh, have more of uh, you know more more positions to be able to do more of what uh, we're seeing in the community as a benefit and i know specifically for for this study i think one of the things i'm interested in is those times where the we didn't have the opportunity to have a clinician uh, or um the co-responder uh, to actually respond to uh, the incident but it was something that was uh, indeed a mental health call for service, I'd like to be able to show the number of times they weren't available uh, so that I can go in and again, use that for justification for providing us with uh, more resources to increase our st uh, staffing capacity. Uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, please, Ryan. I mean, I think one, it's generally the responsibility of government to evaluate its programs as being a good steward of public dollars. I think though it is a, sp a special responsibility for programs that are part of an emerging national movement, that those programs need to be committed to rigorous evaluation so that we can build evidence that the field just doesn't have. Um, and I think, you know, there always have to be programs that are early in a process that don't have the evidence in order to establish it, right? And so cities like Durham and Greensboro and Denver and others that are among the first cities that are doing some of this work um, both take on some risk in that, but also if we're all committed to rigorous evaluation can build evidence for the field. I agree with everything Letitia said about some of the benefits of evaluation, but another one that is apart from um, validating the work or making a case for resources is for that program itself to get better at the things that it's doing. All right. And so we're really one of the things, one of the reasons we really supported a data-driven approach is we know, and it's true, I think of everything the government does that there are opportunities to refine the service delivery model to better meet the needs of the residents we serve. We're really interested in, in understanding what we do well, what we don't do, what we think works a certain way, but may work a different way. Um, that's all really important. I think that in some ways in Durham, some of the basic things that we need to establish are established, but there's a lot to learn about exactly how it works and opportunities to make it better. I think connection to care is a really tricky thing to evaluate for some of the reasons Kristen named, because 
establishing the counterfactual is difficult because some of the things that we track and do are not tracked and other, you know, and the other responses were, were not available. But I think learning how to, to evaluate that more and understand our ability to connect people to care and the outcomes from that care. Are we able to reduce, for example, the um, the number of people who may interact repeatedly? Uh, you know, people have people who call 911 300 times in a month. Can we, through these interventions, better understand needs, better connect neighbors to addressing those needs so that they interact with public safety less often as a result of that improved service? That's gonna, That's really hard to evaluate, but one of the things we aspire to better understand. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Anyone else that wants to weigh in on that topic? All right. Yeah, go ahead, Kristen, please. Oh, I, I was just going to add one more thing. Um, and that is, I think it's important, you know, as Ryan was just saying, the field is just emerging now in terms of the research. And I fully agree. You got to let the innovation happen. But now it's happened. There's a lot of different models in a lot of different communities. And we need to evaluate these, you know, to understand better what organizational characteristics, staffing mix, context matters. What are the most significant components of the po programs? What things are more adaptable? And um, that will allow for everyone to, you know, find the best fit for their community because it's pretty clear, you know, no, no community, there's no one size fits all for this type of program, but through a broader evaluation, we can bring this information together and develop um, sort of a cadre of best practices that communities can draw from. And hopefully that's moving forward now. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Kirby, I saw you came off mute. Yes, yeah, some of the things that I was thinking about that um, we um, as responders think about when we document our interactions is um, we think there's several different um, things that we note per interaction or per call. Uh, for example, we note um, if we were requested specifically by EMS or by police or by fire, um, we document if, if there was a transportation that occurred on scene and who that transportation was by. Uh, we document what supplies were given out, what harm reduction kits were given out. Uh, if there was um, any form of connection to care. And we also uh, document our own safety, like how safe that we felt on scenes. If there was any, if there was anyone harmed during our presence, was a neighbor harmed or was a neighbor, um, was there any restraints used by officers while we were on scene? Um, we also think about and document, did we have did we were we able to meet the neighbors' needs in the capacity that we have, and are there enough resources in Durham, or does Durham have enough capacity in the resources that already exist to um, meet the needs that we were based on the interactions that we have with the neighbor? And um, and one thing that I think that is um, that we have the opportunity to look into is how much um, we're able to divert from in-person response at all, uh, being that we do have a clinician in the call center, because uh, in some cases, if if the, our clinician in the call center does have the capacity to dispatch police or dispatch one of our other response teams or dispatch um, fire EMS, but in some cases, in many cases, when our CCD clinician is interacting over the phone, no in-person response is needed. Um, so those are some of the things that, that I was thinking about when uh, thinking about some of the the things that we collect as far as our interactions with neighbors. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Kirby. And I think um, Shane, if we we're able to put it out in the notes, um, Durham has a dashboard, uh, the DurhamNC.gov backslash heart uh, dash data. Um, that's a really great uh, example of how they're both collecting and being transparent with data. So just wanted to call that out there. And then uh, Kirby, something you mentioned, but um, this could be answered by anyone. Um, we talked a little bit about the outcomes of interest uh, for those in the community. Um, as you're standing these organizations up and they're newer, is there any thought and consideration, and this is speaking to several of the questions that we've gotten from attendees, about first, how are you figuring out which of these calls are appropriate for an alternative response? How are you ensuring the safety of responders acutely in that moment of response? And then also, is there also this consideration for um, a cumulative uh, accumulation 
of stress and trauma that you'd have to protect against burnout for the long term. Um, best outcomes for the uh, for the responders in the organization. And so I know that's a lot, but any considerations there about just really focusing inward as an organization and making sure that these responders are being taken care of. And specifically, too, also with the officers in the um, times of co-response, are there special considerations for the type of training that they're receiving to make them effective in these positions? So I think I just asked about five or six questions there in one. So if anyone wants to unpack that, go ahead. I'll uh, I'll talk a little bit because I think we're we're now facing some of those questions with our team. So, uh, as a community, we we felt um, hey, I'm, I've said this I think on another panel I've had with Ryan. Uh, appreciate the work that Durham has done with this, and we've learned a lot. They they kind of took a different path to get to where they are at in their programs than we did. We kind of. Uh, they built the ship and then took off. We we built it while we were flying it a little bit uh, in Greensboro, um, but that that's what kind of pushed us to toward our co-responder model. Um, we we felt our community still wanted to make sure that we were sending somebody out, even with a crisis counselor, to make sure that there was a, the safety issue taken care of. Um, but because of the success of that program. We have seen our officers rely heavily on our behavioral health response team, and they're being called frequently. We had carved out a certain category of calls that they would automatically be dispatched to if available, suicidal calls, mental health calls. Uh, but we quickly realized that there are uh, different mental health components to just a, a ton of other different calls, whether it is trespassing or a shoplifter or a, a domestic disturbance that came in where there's a significant mental health component. So what we have seen is now our agency over rely on that behavioral health response team, creating a, a real heavy load of stress on them. And so we're actually looking at some opportunities on, on how we do that, where we may have to, to pull back some of their response to reduce that stress load, focus on a crisis response, and then I think our next step is hopefully to develop and grow in that non-crisis response category, similar to what uh, Durham has now, where they're sending uh, counselors out without a police response at all or uh, a diversion at our 911. So we're, we're, we're kind of right in the middle of trying to figure that out right now as an agency. Uh, we're lucky we have some, some good partners to look to for examples on how to develop that, but that for us is our, our next step in the evolution of, of this program. Yeah, and, thanks so much, Chief. Letitia, yeah, it doesn't hurt yeah. to have, it doesn't hurt to have a chief of police in your corner on something like that, yeah, it's pretty nice. Absolutely not, it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> and I would add to what Chief was saying when he, he talked about the, um, the officers, you know, the over-reliance, I'm gonna say city as a whole, uh, you know, one of the things that has happened is because our behavioral health response team is so good at what they do, uh, they are now the people that are called nonstop, not just on the police radios, but my emails, you know, from our council members calling, community members calling, uh, downtown um business owners calling. I think, you know, someone someone in, in one of the questions was uh, related to like the homeless uh, homelessness population that, and if there was a response team related, um, you know, very similar to the behavioral health response teams. And you know, one of the things that we are finding is that because of the ability of the work of, of the staff, and how well they're able to engage with community and help connect to services and all of the wonderful things they do. Now there is this over-reliance on, on them um, to the point where I get concerned because I want to protect the well-being of my staff because at the end of the day, I want them to be able to show up and do their job well without having you know that burden of so many uh, you know getting inundated with so many different um calls and calls that are outside the preview of what they actually should be doing so. absolutely go ahead kirby you go first uh, i was just going to say that um 
when thinking about responder safety, I really appreciate how um, our admin team fully integrated our responders in our dispatch system and in 911. So, um, so that means that we uh, are dispatched directly through um, our radios, but we also um, have access to CAD, uh, which is our dispatch system in which we are able to um, see, we are able to look up the history of any alerts at specific addresses. We're able to uh, put ourselves, assure ourselves in or out, arrived or, or to specify where our locations are. Um, on our radios, we're taught how to call for help, how to determine what response codes uh, and response protocols are necessary if we find ourselves in danger. Um, we've had uh, scene safety training from officers of, about how to um, how to position ourselves and how to be mindful of where we park our vehicles and, and those types of things that have been really helpful as far as thinking about our safety on scenes. And, and I think that also between responders, we do a really good job of holding each other accountable and sort of being true and honest to those, those the things that we're feeling in the moment and being transparent with our teammates about what, what some of those concerns might be. And so I think holding space for each other in those moments has also been really helpful. Um, and so I'll, I'll pass it back off to you, Ryan. Yeah, I guess the last thing I want to say, I know we're about done with time, is one thing I want to leave if there are folks from across the country or where you're considering this is, I do want to say that I think there is growing very clear evidence that there are calls that we have traditionally sent law enforcement to that we can safely send other types of responders to. Right over the last year in Durham, we did that over 1,500 times. Um, we tracked how our responders feel on every call. They felt safe 99.5% of the time. We had no safety concern, you know, no safety issues in terms of like anyone being injured. Um, so there are a lot of calls out there. Um, it's key to like have good data. So we had good data. We did everything we could in due diligence before launching to learn about data. Like what are the priority levels of these calls? How often has an officer ever been hurt on a call of these types? all of that thing. And then you start and you make sure that you are constantly like you are learning every day, you're connected and understand what your teams are experiencing, and then you can adjust if needed. And you train with the understanding that there's uncertainty and risk on every call. It is true of every public safety agency. We send a lot of other responders out there, EMS and fire to calls that could go lots of different ways without, without, you know, without a, a weapon. We can do that for these types of lower level calls. And a lot of cities now are building that evidence. And I want people to hear that and feel like there's, I think, growing confidence that that's work that we can do. And we still need law enforcement for a lot of other calls and ways in which clinicians can be supportive. But there are a lot of low priority calls where with the right training and integration into 911 and all the things that Kirby said, that we can do this safely and appropriately. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Ryan. And what's really struck me in both Durham and Greensboro is the partnership between the police departments and the community safety office and departments there. I think that that's um, really critical to success of both of those organizations and it serves the public really well. So we are almost out of time and I wanna just address a few things. So there are questions that have been asked that are wonderful um, that need to be followed up on. We will follow up um, each and every one of those questions with you via email from the registration that you all provided. And also there's further opportunities to learn more about this. Um, so please join us uh, uh, next week as RTI hosts the Alternative Responses to Policing Sy Symposium. That's on September 21st and 22nd. The event will feature a multidisciplinary group of federal, state, and city practitioners and policymakers, much like this panel here. The symposium will uh, focus on critical issues surrounding the implementation of alternatives to police response strategies and how they can be effectively sustained and evaluated. Uh, this event can be accessed virtually. We uh, included the event uh, information in the chat. So please, uh, if you can, please register for that and join us. Some of the same speakers are kind enough to share their time with that as well. Um, before we leave, so again, I just want to respond. I will follow up or find the appropriate person to follow up on any of the questions, the great questions that we didn't have an opportunity to answer. Um, if you do have anything else last minute, put it in right now. Um, so I would like to just wrap up and thank all of the panelists so much. Appreciate your time, your dedication. Appreciate your time, not only today, but how you serve the communities. 
Um, I mean this sincerely. It's both humbling uh, and inspiring, and it's great to be able to work with you all. For the folks from RTI, Kristen, thank you for sharing your time. We're excited to hear about your future work and evaluation in this area. And also like to thank Shane Hamstra and Laura Beth O'Brien for doing a lot of the coordination and making this happen. Thank you, everybody. Have a safe and wonderful rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining. Bye, all.